The last month I began a teaching, and I told you that I had started this many years ago and, 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 and stopped, didn't finish it. And now I really feel like the Lord is calling me at this time to, uh, to take it to conclusion. And uh, I, I showed you guys uh, a, a little line chart last, last time, last month, and I talked about the transition for people going from spiritual refugee to spiritual immigrant to finally spiritual citizen. And I, and I talked about how a lot of people will come to a place in their life where they feel dry, they feel like they haven't, they, they haven't really done anything, they haven't gone anywhere. Perhaps they were Christians and they had a vibrancy and that vibrancy is gone. Uh, and they have a, a spiritual experience and then for whatever reason it all kind of dries up and they're longing for that experience, they're longing for that intimacy again. And, and, and so the, what, we're going to be, what, we're going to, what we're talking about in these lessons is, is that process of restoring spiritual vibrancy to a person. <clears throat> and and uh, you know, for, for those that, that have been Christians for a long time, I you know, want you to remember that you know, those first years, how exciting it was to be a Christian. It was like walking out of a thick fog into bright sunshine day. It was like the lights are being turned on. Everything was dark. And now everything is different, everything tastes different, everything feels different, everything sounds different. You realize that Jesus loves you and you're going to live forever. And, and you can't wait to tell your friends about this new thing you've discovered because you want them to know Jesus too, because they're your friends, you want them to live forever too. And, and there's this vibrancy and this excitement. And, we're, and we begin taking these first steps in this journey of discovery, discovery and wonder where, as far as we can tell, all things are possible for those who believe. And we feel that way, and we're talking to people that, that have hard hearts, and, and they start believing in Jesus too. We go, wow! I, I never, let me go find the hardest-hearted guy that I know, and let me share the gospel. And we're out doing stuff like this, and people are getting saved, and, and, and people are, are listening, and it's just a really exciting time. And we go through our life, and somewhere along the way, something changes. And for many people, they may or may not be able to put their finger on when the change began to happen, but they find themselves in a place that they never anticipated it'd be. They thought they were on their way to the promised land, but now sometimes it feels like instead of crossing the River Jordan, they're back wandering in the desert. They've become spiritual refugees. They've become people that have been displaced from their country. And tonight we're going to talk about how different ways that people end up becoming spiritual refugees. Now let me tell you why this is important for us. Because as we, as we share the gospel with people and as we try to rally the church to move in, in revival, many of the people that we try to rally... They're going to look at us like we're crazy, like we don't know what we're doing. They're going to look at us like, what's wrong with you? I mean, why can't we just do what we've, all, we've been doing? They're going to be stuck. And when we talk about we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we're, we're walking with Jesus, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, they might even use that language, but there's nothing in their life that shows that that's, that that's true. There's no evidence in their life that supports that type of belief. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and when you tell them, well, okay, now that we've been, you know, say things like what Ernesto just said, now we're going to step out, and because the power of God is around us, and we're going to step out into the world, and we're going to share the gospel with power, and, and incredible things are going to happen, and people are going to get saved, and the revival is going to kick in here, and many people that are going to trip are going to go, yeah, I don't know, I don't know, you know, everybody thinks that's going to happen. And, and, and we, it can be really discouraging to us. You know, because we're on fire, we're moving, it can be really discouraging to us that all of these other people just seem so oblivious. They don't seem to understand what is happening, what God is doing. And we can get really discouraged and go, you know, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to go out to Montana someplace and put a wall around and get a whole bunch of fired up Christians and we're going to just live there and wait until Jesus comes again. Now this is a story that's repeated over and over in history where groups of people, because they were discouraged about how the world treated them and how the church treated them, withdrew. Okay? 
But part of the problem is they didn't know why they were being treated that way. They didn't understand the dynamics of what was going on. So what we're going to be looking at is this process of taking people from this state of being spiritual refugees, where they don't recognize that they're citizens of, of the kingdom of God and they're not living that way, of how to walk them from that place to full citizenship. Not just in theory, not just, well, Scripture says it's so, and so therefore it must be so, but I'm going to go live any way I want to live. Not that, but really living a vibrant Christian life with, it, with intimacy with Jesus and walking in the Spirit. So we want, to think, we want to learn about the process and what the causes of this are so that we can help people get back on the right path. People that are Christians. Yep. And some people that may have been cultural Christians, they may have been in the church, but never really believed in Jesus. So for them, we'll have a message of salvation and, and, and light them up along with the other people in their churches that are, that are just dull and just not seem to be, well, that nothing really matters. Okay? Now, I'm not going to be teaching out of Jonah. But we're going to be reading out of Jonah as I teach. Okay? I think there's parallels here. We're going to let the let the words let the words speak and and, and, and I'm I'm going to I'm I think, unless God does something in the midst of the lesson, I'm going to stay away from what the scripture says, but I think the scripture is important for us. In Jonah we see a prophet who rebelled against God. Who did? Who, who had to be forced to follow it to follow his call? Had to be forced to follow his call, mm -hmm. and then he didn't like it after it happened. So Jonah acted like a spiritual refugee, even though he was working and doing stuff for God. He didn't act like God's man at all, not a single step. So, so I want to, as you look at Jonah, I want you to realize that there can be people that are spiritual refugees that have great giftings. They can be prophets. They can have the gifting of miracles. They can have all kinds of giftings, but they don't use them. And God has to force them to be used. Okay? And some people are like that, and they're still not waking up in the midst of it. Okay? So I, I, I felt like Jonah is a nice parallel story as we go through. So somebody read the first chapter of Jonah, just one, all the way to the end, end of one. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose and to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish, and so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. The, then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down to lowest parts of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call your God, perhaps your God will consider us, so that we may not perish. They said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble and has come upon us. So they cast lots, and it fell on Jonah. Then he said to him, Please tell us, what causes this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? What do you do? And where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? And he said to, to them, I'm a Hebrew. I felt, I fear the Lord. And I fear the Lord and God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the man knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told him. Then he, had, then he said to them, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea is growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, 
Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and let the sea become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with this innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done this as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from raging. It's raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. <laughs> One small comment on this. Notice in the beginning, everybody was praying to their own gods. Yes. Right? And then Jonah told him who he was. And they, and then they, they, they started praying to his God. Yeah. To the Lord. And they threw him in. So even a bad testimony is a good testimony. Yeah. It's also interesting that when it comes to ships, Tarshish, Tarshish probably also being Tarsus, the pole is from, yeah. two ships both break up. A man of God in disobedience is responsible for the nearly conception of a ship because he was out of alignment with God. Yeah. And I just saw this as she was reading. Yeah. I'd never seen this before. Yeah. Another man from Tarshish, Tarsus, Paul, his ownership as a slave, and the ship is is determined to be broken, but because he is on it, God gives him the ship and says, everybody has it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's job. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And it's interesting that he, although he's disobedient, still he's raised on a third day. Yeah. 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 Flip back to spiritual vibrancy. <laughs> Drifting away. When we're not really attentive to spiritual growth, we might look back and find that we have just gradually drifted away from the path we were on. We may not have noticed any dramatic changes. We were just keeping on keeping on, just kind of living our life, going through the motions. And we're doing church activities. Perhaps we were even keeping on with our devotional life. Maybe we were even reading the Bible regularly and praying regularly. But the spiritual highway that we thought we were on starts to feel more like a twisty path through familiar landscape. We thought we were making progress, but then we come back to a crossroads and it feels eerily like we had been right in this exact same place a few years before. This The change in the landscape kind of snuck up on the sermons began to sound familiar and the same. We began to do the same things at church that we were doing five or ten years ago. We were busy, we were moving, but instead of the journey being from new discovery to new discovery, it's more like we're just recycling our religion. Cycling back on the things we had done before. Cycling back on the things we had done before. Our path has cut through the forest, but we realized that we are merging into a desert and it's very dry and it's very barren. The very things that we may have done a number of years before that made us excited about Jesus and loving Jesus, now we're doing those same things and they're dry as bones. They're dry as desert sand. So it could be that this spiritual lethargy just kind of snuck up on us. And then now we're just kind of noticing that we've been on this wrong path. We've been cycling back and back. We didn't notice it before, but now we realize it. 